Well, good morning. It is a rainy <laughs> Wednesday, September the 25th. We're going into the second book of Samuel, and this is chapter 1. Now it came to pass after the death of Saul, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David had abode two days in Ziklag. It came even to pass on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul, with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. And so it was when he came to David that he fell to earth and did obeisance. And David said unto him, From whence comest thou? And he said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. And David said unto him, How went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered, That the people are fled from the battle, and many of the people also are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan his son are dead also. And David said unto the young man that told him, How knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan his son be dead? And the young man that told him said, As I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called unto me, and I answered, Here am I. And he said unto me, Where art thou? And I answered him, I am. Who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said unto me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me, for anguish is come upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. So I stood upon him and slew him, because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. And I took the crown that was upon his head and the bracelet that was on his arm, and have brought them hither unto my Lord. And David took hold on his clothes and rent them, and likewise all the men that were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until even for Saul and for Jonathan his son, and for the people of the Lord, and for the house of Israel, because they were fallen by the sword. And David said unto the young man that told him, Whence art thou? And he answered, I am the son of a stranger, an Amalekite. And David said unto him, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And David called one of the young men and said, Go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. And David said unto him, Thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth hath testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. And David lamented with his lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan his son. And he bade them teach the children of Judah the use of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Yasher. The beauty of Israel is slain upon thy high places. How are the mighty fallen? Tell it not in Gath, publish it not in the streets of Ascalon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. Ye mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew, let there be rain upon you, nor fields of offerings, for the shield of the mighty is vilely cast away, the shield of Saul, as though he had not been anointed with oil from the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan turned not back, and the sword of Saul returned not empty. And Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. Ye daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet with other delights, who put on ornaments of gold upon your apparel. How mighty the might, how, excuse me, how are the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle? O Jonathan, thou wast slain in thine high places. I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. How are the mighty fallen and the weapons of war perished? 
David is speaking of an agape love that is mightier than the love of a woman or a man for a woman. Okay? That agape love is a godly love. And so we must keep it in that perspective. It's sorrowful to read this because when David got the news, he rent his clothes. This is the tradition today still. When uh, hostages are murdered in Gaza, their families will tear their garments. They'll, you know, rip their clothes. They don't adorn in ashes anymore, but that's what they did, sackcloth and ashes. Mordecai did it, um, as we, you know, we will read later in the book of Ruth and uh, her uncle. And uh, it, it, was a, it was a way of expressing sorrow and grief, um, deep sorrow and deep grief, beyond words, you know, that it, it needed an expression. <laughs> I see a little cat behind me there. Um, and so, you know, this hurt David greatly, so much so that the messenger, upon his confession of actually, you know, Doing what Saul asked, he had slain God's anointed nonetheless. And um, he paid the price with his life, whom God hath anointed with oil. Saul had been chosen by God. Remember that. Samuel was told that. So now we're in the second book of Samuel. It's kind of strange because Samuel died in the first book of Samuel. So... Um, I'm not too sure who the author of 2 Samuel would be if Samuel died in the first book. So that's kind of a mystery to me. Maybe I'll look that one up and tell you later. There is something that is bugging me. There is something that is bugging me. And uh, it is biblical, and I'm going to air my view on this. So this is the end of chapter 1, second book of Samuel. Uh, if you want to turn off now, feel free to. But one thing that I have noticed is that there is a lot of pressure coming from churches about healings and miracles. And I just delivered a sermon on faith on Sunday um, at Paramount, and it was Hebrews 11 talking about faith. And ironically, um, Daniel Moritz talked about faith as well on Sunday. And so, um, you know, it, it seemed to be a good godly message. And what I was coming up with this morning was that a lot of people want a miracle. They want a healing in life. And you've got to say, well, what's the, you know, there's always a motivation behind something. And, and the only clear motivation that really stands out is that people want proof of God. They want proof. Now, you could say, well, you know, Chris, they just want a healing. They don't want cancer anymore. They don't want to limp anymore. They don't want to be blind anymore or have to wear glasses anymore. And yes, that's true as well. But, you know, when we read about faith, faith gives us endurance, the endurance to suffer. Now, look at all the apostles. And I'm talking about all the apostles, including John, including Peter. Paul, the final apostle. Look how they all suffered in the name of Christ. Yes, John was in exile, living in a cave in Patmos. I mean, that's suffering. You know, you go live in a cave for years upon end and see how suffering that is. They suffered to the point of death, the rest of them, and cruel and horrible deaths, and, and lives of, of poverty, and traveling and, 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 you know, hardship. Does any of that sound like the kind of faith that we're demonstrating today? The faith to endure? No. It says the faith of a mustard seed will move mountains. That's a metaphor, okay? It means if you've got enough little faith in me, and when we read what faith is, is believing in the unseen, then we don't have to see, do we? We only need that little tiny bit of faith to believe in the unseen 
But no, we want to see with our eyes, don't we? And churches are pampering to this left, right, and center. Oh, you're going to get your healing. I declare it in the name of Jesus Christ, you're going to get your healing. Why? Why do they do that to people? And people, let me tell you right now, the power of the mind can overcome certain things. You can con yourself into believing, oh, my limp's gone. Oh, I feel better. Oh, I can see now. Oh, I've been cured from cancer. God will uphold his creation with his mighty right hand. And sometimes the grace of God will fall upon you. And in your favor, maybe those charts, those, those scans were misread originally. And now you don't have cancer. Or maybe for some reason a little malignant or, or benign lump has gone away. And it wasn't cancer in the first place. True biblical healings belong in the first century among the apostles. Can Christ still perform miracles today? Can God do that? Of course he can. You name me one true biblical miracle that matches up with the first century. Name one. It would be in all the newspapers spread around all the world for someone before everybody's eyes. And don't forget, God always had witnesses. Jesus, God insists that be witnesses to all these things. The Catholic Church, bless their hearts, they investigate miracles. I mean, taking years and years and years. I've said this before. But the thing is, it's in your heart. What's in your heart that you demand a miracle from God? Do you not have the faith to endure for Jesus Christ and to take pleasure in your suffering, knowing that you're sharing the suffering of Jesus Christ? It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. Paul states it. To share in the suffering of Jesus Christ. Do not tell me or my wife that we do not have enough faith because we are enduring and we believe in Jesus Christ and we stand on that rock. There is someone from a past church who is constantly bombarding my wife, telling her she doesn't have enough faith, telling her how to pray Stop this mindless lack of faith in Jesus Christ and start enduring. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. That means unto death. The cross symbolized a cruel death. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. And on the prosperity note, what did he tell that young man? He said, sell everything, give it away to the poor and follow me. God does not mean for you to be prosperous in this world. He doesn't mean for everybody to be prosperous. Those that are, he's entrusted with much. They prove themselves with a little, and he is trusting them with more. And so some of these people can do things with the money that we couldn't do because we would indulge ourselves. And that's why God has kept me poor, because money goes through my fingers like water. I know it. I know it. I will never be rich. If I'm rich, it's the devil's doing, not God's. If I don't get healed of anything in my life, my back pain is getting worse and, and things like that. Trisha's fibromyalgia, her um, arthritis, you know, they come and go. Sometimes the, the pills ease it, and sometimes they don't, and sometimes she suffers a lot. But she endures through Jesus Christ. So don't tell my wife that she doesn't have enough faith, because she has buckets of faith, buckets of mustard seeds, and she endures in the name of Jesus Christ. Please. Whoever's doing this to my wife, stop it. If you know that person, tell them to stop it. Tell them to get right with Jesus Christ. 
Tell them to be strong in Jesus Christ. Tell them to endure in the name of Jesus Christ. And we will pray for you. Because God loves you too. And I love you and you and you and you and all of you out there. Thank you for listening and watching. Thank you for partaking in this. Thank you for your shares and your comments too. Till tomorrow. Bye for now.